Good morning. Welcome back to the Junius Multi Channel. Let's get right into some recent headlines, uh, talk about some articles that I found interesting, and bring them up for the community discussion and your guys' take and spin. Uh, so let's get right into it. Not going to spend a whole lot of time on this first one because you guys all know my feelings when we see headlines and articles pertaining to what the Fed may or may not do. As you see, your Fed officials. Again, debating and discussing what they're going to do about rates, keeping it secret, don't want to let too much information out, and it's just that carrot that they hold out in front of investors and the markets, uh, always just creating this atmosphere of impending uncertainty. Um, there's no direction, no idea of what exactly is going to happen or what they're discussing, just a lot of debate and uh, I, I would call it almost like theater, um, smoke and mirrors, uh, tricks. It's like a magic show, you know. There's a magician up there, and the whole thing's rigged. We all know he's not really performing magical tricks, but he acts like he is, and the audience laughs and pretends that it's it's you know entertainment. But it's just a, it's a cheap sideshow in Vegas, and exactly that, you know, it's a casino, and it's rigged, and it's not going to do anything but create more of the same and wealth transfer. We all, anyways, I promised I wasn't going to spend too much time on that, so we're not going to. Quick look at gold and silver and their little brother, copper, but most importantly, gold and silver. What are they doing? Down a little bit today, buying opportunity, but silver's still up 1887. You know, definitely off those lows we saw earlier in the year. And like I've told you guys in the past, I haven't looked at these numbers in a while. Um, I just don't care what the price of these metals really is. I'll know when it's too much and uh, when when it's all over the news that the values of gold and silver are fill in the blank and they're exorbitantly much higher than they are now, that's when you know it's too late to buy them. It won't be available. It won't be in shops. And the, the global reaction to all of the things that we've discussed here, the the economic catastrophe that could potentially unfold and the inflation and the resulting run for precious metals in places to hide and park one's wealth. Once that unfolds, it's just it, it'll happen at the speed of thought and none of us will be able to react quick enough to. This article is going to be fun to talk about. Anti-gold wealth manager buys gold for the first time. Rising inflation expectations have attracted an unlikely investor to gold. Richard Bernstein, who has spent more than 35 years on Wall Street, is buying gold for his clients' portfolios for the first time. My firm and I are not gold bugs, said Bernstein, a former chief investment strategist for Merrill Lynch, who started his eponymous firm in 2009 at the Morning Star ETF conference on Thursday. Most of the people who tell you stories about gold are people trying to sell you gold funds and gold ETFs. And those stories are not based on reality at all. So he immediately has to defend himself, um, defame the character of others, and hurl insults at those who do buy gold and look at it as a positive place to park one's wealth and invest money or hedge, I guess you could say. But uh, a lot of what he said there immediately is untrue. Uh, most people who tell you stories, see that? I mean, just look at the wording he chooses here. Um, I don't know. Do, do I tell you guys stories? Do, do I sell? I've never sold gold to anybody ever, actually. Uh, I don't sell gold. I don't sell ETFs. As a matter of fact, quite opposite. I've always spoke to not buy ETFs. Don't even go near paper gold or exchange traded funds. Run from them. Burn them. And uh, you know, smack the people that try to sell them to you. And don't even buy gold funds. Remember, paper gold is not gold. When you want to buy gold, buy gold. Do not buy paper gold ever. You're just giving criminals money and encouraging the fools. When Bernstein used to teach at New York University's Stern School of Business, probably a Federal Reserve-funded school that was started 
on that charter many years ago, he would ask his students what the difference was between gold and wampum, the shell beads that American Indians used to trade. <laughs> the correct answer was, there is no difference, he said. It's a real asset that we ascribe some romantic value to that kind of becomes a pseudo-currency. A pseudo-currency? So what's a real currency, my man? Mr. Bernstein Bear? Uh, the correct answer is there's no difference. Well, let's see there. There's quite a few differences. Uh, beads and shells. Now, there's an endless supply because shells are an organic matter. They're uh, creatures that are born and live in the ocean, and they spawn, and they create more of them, and there's an endless supply, and they're always being made. And if you wanted to, you could probably find a way to breed them and put them in a little tank or aquarium and then make your own shells and thus print your own currency. Follow me here. Now, gold. We've already talked about the, the many attributes of gold that make it an ideal form of currency, if not the currency. It's how, how recognizable it is. It, you know, these shells he speaks of are decomposable. Again, they're organic matter. Um, there's a varying weight to them in size. Now, you look at gold and how rare it is, how it's easily recognizable, how an image can be struck into it, how it can be formed in the shape of coins. I mean, you look at the whole history, just look at what Greenspan wrote about gold. Um, and that's, again, in the archives here on the channel, Greenspan on gold. We've talked about that speech. The difference between gold and seashells. I don't know where seashells are on the periodic table of the elements. Perhaps Mr. Bernstein could help me find on the periodic table where seashells are, where wampum is. Uh, very confused as to what element they are and what part of the universe they occupy as an essential element. Now, yes... We're getting a little sidetracked here. We're probably going to get a little excitable. That's what happens when idiots like this Mr. Bernstein character um, try to act like they are the they were given to us from up on high, and they come to us bearing these tablets, and they're going to explain to you and me, the peasants, uh, what's important, what's not, what's currency, what's not. Because of course he he taught at New York University Stern School of Business, so he's. This guy is like an almighty in the world of economics, am I right? Um, and he doesn't even know the difference between seashells and gold. But when Bernstein quizzed conference attendees on the right time to buy real assets like metals, he revealed the reasoning behind a gold buy for a guy who thinks it's, quote, wampum. The answer? You buy real assets when inflation expectations are starting to go up, he said. Now bear with me in this episode because we're going to get to some inflation stories towards the end. Again, this is going to be a long one, so you guys got to kind of bear with it here. Recent statements from the Federal Reserve indicate a greater willingness to tolerate rising inflation expectations, Bernstein said. For a long time, gold was really not a diversifier, Bernstein said. When gold prices hit new highs earlier this decade, Gold had a positive correlation to stocks, meaning when stocks rose, so did gold prices. Gold has become slightly negatively correlated to the stock market, Bernstein said, and so gold adds extra ballast in a portfolio to hedge against volatility. It's a change in the way we look at the world, Bernstein said. Gold prices have surged this year. The world's largest gold-backed exchange traded fund, SPDR Gold Shares, has risen 25.75%. So far in 2016. On Friday, gold dipped as a typically dovish Federal Reserve voting member gave comments that the market interpreted as signaling a willingness to hike rates sooner than the market has been expecting. Now, Berenstein is a former chief investment strategist for Merrill Lynch. Now, many of you might remember Merrill Lynch had a pretty tough time back during the financial crisis, and this gentleman used to work there. It just says here that he was one of their chief investment strategist. So we'll see what his track record ended up doing. Well, Merrill Lynch uh, blew up their firm, and as you know, they had a pretty tough time back in 2008 due to some very poor financial planning and decisions for their institution. And uh, that's that's Berenstein's resume. He, he's got that on his, on his track record there. 
Now here's a guy that thought, thinks gold is, uh, is wampum. He said it's the same thing as seashells. And we've all heard that argument before and we've addressed it. And the fact is it's just not true. There is no connection between seashells and gold. We've talked about this at length and there's just no reason to keep discussing it. We've got numerous videos discussing the attributes of gold. You know, how it was traded globally. Every single civilization on the planet it seems has at some point used gold going back 70 centuries. It's been on every continent. It's been valued by every human. It is the foundation of money and wealth. It always has been. It always will be. Now, Deutsche Bank says that the 35-year party is over for the bond bulls. This is an interesting article here because the global economy is at an inflection point that could mark the end of a roughly three-and-a-half-decade bond rally while creating intense heartburn for politicians and other economic policy makers, Deutsche Bank analysts said Friday in a report. We argue that we're about to see a reshaping of the world order that has dictated economics, politics, policy, and asset prices from around 1980 to the present day wrote analysts Jim Reed, Nick Burns, and Sukanto Chanda in the bank's annual long-term asset return study. Since the early 1980s, the global economy has been dominated by globalization and massive changes in demographics, which have also helped dictate asset performance. That era is now coming to a close, the analysts said, which means the economic, political, policy, and asset trends that accompanied it could soon begin to reverse. Extrapolation of the last 35 years will be one of the most dangerous things that policymakers and investors can do going forward, they wrote. This will likely make the next 35 years very different from the last 35 years. Here is a figure of the annualized bond market returns by decades since 1940. So there you go. And again, it's going to be very different going into the future. This is their best case outlook. Put bluntly, the best realistic scenario for financial stability in the new era is that bondholders around the world see a slow, real adjusted haircut over several years, probably over at least a couple of decades. The best example of this through history was the post-World War II period where government debt was at similar levels to that currently seen, except we didn't fight a giant global war just now. Over the next 35 years, this debt was successfully eroded by a long period where nominal GDP was notably above bond yields, so bondholders took a large real haircut. The four decades leading up to 1980 saw very bad overall real returns and fixed income. These hugely negative returns occurred largely without defaults and were terrible for investors, but they obviously helped reset the financial system, which was very over-levered. For such an outcome to have been achieved, we needed financial repression and perhaps a reversal of the globalization trend that had built up before World War I. There were substantial restrictions on the global flow of capital that allowed money to be trapped within countries, thus allowing them to direct investments towards domestic policy issues such as financing the huge debt burden. Such a scenario might seem alien to us in 2016, but it seems invariably, but it seems invariable that capital restrictions in some form or another, will be a feature under this scenario. In many ways, this has already happened, as financial regulation has encouraged banks, insurance companies, and pension funds to buy domestic bonds for non-relative value reasons. This will surely have to continue. Maybe it will be more difficult in today's integrated world to limit international capital flows in the same ways as after World War II. So perhaps the cushion will come from a long period ahead of money printing and bond purchasing to ensure that there is no run on debt markets given the likely negative real returns. 
Here's the alternative, which they dub the hard break. Rather than an artificial reflation and slow, successful, non-systemic deleveraging, there is a genuine risk of a more binary outcome where a major country, countries sees a hard default on its debt, taking a lot of other debt with it, domestically and possibly internationally. This is probably most likely to happen via politics, especially in Europe, if a country decides to leave the single currency. Under this scenario, non-core government bond markets could see huge losses as the central bank backstop bid is removed. Government bonds lose under both scenarios, but clearly scenario two would be very negative for economies that went through it. And they close the article with the quote, a challenging few decades likely awaits us. Challenging might be an understatement. Interesting tidbit of news, Romania's central bank denies media rumors that the gold reserves are missing. It's never good when a bank is rumored to be empty. And here we have a bank uh, in Europe. The Romanian Central Bank's gold reserve amounts to 103.7 tons, the same level as in 2007. Its current value is around 3.9 billion euros. The institution published the information after several rumors in the media that they were missing the gold from their reserves. Now, they published a statement, it sounds like, but... Did they show anyone the gold? It uh, doesn't sound like the gold was on display or that it was filmed, photographed, or accounted for. Uh, it would be nice if you were accused of not having it by the media to quickly be able to dispel those rumors by demonstrating and showing that, yes, indeed, you had the gold on hand. But it sounds like they just merely released some financial records some paper, if you will. Now, why central banks are quietly loading up on gold shares, this is going to tie into the, the discussion that's basically tied into every single one of these articles. You heard it from the beginning from our friend Mr. Berenstein, who started buying gold because he spoke of inflation taking place. We just saw that there's a difficult few decades in front of us and a discussion regarding printing more monies to support bonds, uh, inflation there being discussed, and now you see the sticky price inflation at the highest level since 2009 and what it means for gold. Uh, what we're seeing here is that the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta routinely publishes a special inflation index known as the sticky price CPI. Generally speaking, it's a measure of the prices for goods and services that don't usually experience wild swings. In other words, when the prices for these things rise, it usually takes a significant amount of time for them to come back down and the same for when they fall. Right now, the sticky price CPI is at its highest level since 2009, which was officially part of the last recession. This has big implications for gold and the SPDR Gold Trust ETF, and especially gold mining stocks, because gold tends to rise quickly when fears of inflation become mainstream. Right now, inflation expectations are quite subdued particularly because the more flexible CPI is actually negative. Well, we all know those are actually a manipulated number and that they're being suppressed to ward off panic. Currently, the average Joe on the street has little idea of what the price of gold is because he does not fear inflation. He expects his dollars to more or less retain their value or that their value will decline slow enough that he will not notice it or that he will get pay raises to compensate. If he loses these expectations, the average person will start turning to gold. That is, if the average person is smart enough, many of them are not, so many of them will not. Thankfully, it leaves more gold for us. Right now, the metal is only an investment hedge for institutional players and still trending up since December. If inflation starts to become obvious, though, and the sticky CPI suggests that this might soon happen, any upside revaluation in the price of gold is likely to be quick and intense. So there you go. A lot of complicated discussion there. We covered a couple of different key articles that uh, were out recently. All of them, in my opinion, point to uh, 
several factors. One, guys like Bernstein are being forced to admit that gold is a safe place to be and, they need, and they're starting to move their money in that direction. And when they're caught doing so, they come up with excuses and backpedal a little bit and even continue to hurl insults at gold. Uh, just because that's the way they were trained, that's the way they were brought up, that's what they do. Um, we're seeing uncertainty from the Fed still because they don't want to come out and say it right away that, yeah, inflation's out of control, it's going to get more out of control, and we're going to probably raise interest rates. And, and then you've got all of these things happening that um, in the bond market, changes taking place, people talking about difficult decades coming, we're seeing statements that are discussing the fact that they're going to have to almost print their way out of this, money printing and bond purchasing, to ensure that there's no run on the debt markets. Well, all of this adds up to one thing. There's going to be some form of a run towards gold at some point. I don't know when that date is going to come. I can't tell you that. It's difficult to know what's going to happen and when exactly it's going to happen. But all you and I can do is continue to try to piece together each bit of information as it comes out, put it together, discuss it, and try to formulate a plan um, in order to properly react to whatever direction the economy might move. Uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of us here on the channel are of the same mind that, yes, it's going to be a difficult 35 or more years in front of us than it was in the last 35 and things are going to be a lot different so buckle up keep stacking thank you all for your support uh, let's keep the momentum going on that coin let's get it out there thank you all for participating and being members here of the junior small p channel don't forget to like these videos it does show up in your little social media feeds and uh share them Keep subscribed. If you're not subscribed already, go ahead and click the subscribe button. That also helps grow this community and get the word out there. So uh, thanks for all of your support, all of you who participate um, and donate and help this channel maintain what it is. Thank you all for being here. Have a good day.